I'd like to introduce you to photochemical vapor generation. Just spend a few moments with that. It's what we're doing in our laboratory at the moment. It's, uh, I don't know if it's really revolutionary. It's certainly very different from what inorganic chemists know about photochemistry because there are no reports in the photochemical literature about volatile molecular metallic species being formed by photochemical techniques. Here we introduce a sample containing a low molecular weight organic acid, such as acetic, formic, or propionic acid. And we expose the solution of the sample and the low molecular weight acid to an ultraviolet field from a simple UV lamp. The solution is then go passed to a conventional gas liquid separator, like is used for chemical vapor generation. And then the volatile species transferred to the atomizer. A variety of UV sources can be used from a, uh, a sterilization lamp like you get from Cole Palmer, um, a pen lamp used for spectroscopic alignment of, of instrumentation. Uh, we have a flow through lamp now, uh, even light emitting diodes, very low power LEDs operating in the deep UV. The interesting thing about photochemical vapor generation, it is more immune to classical interferences than, than chemical vapor generation. Here we see the immunity of vapor generation of selenium to the presence of nickel and cobalt at concentrations as high as 100 to 200 parts per million. If you go into the literature, these interferences cause significant reduction of selenium generation with classical tetrahydroborate reaction at much lower concentrations. We've speculated on the mechanisms of photochemical vapor generation and we feel that photochemical generation of free radicals likely uh, is, is what's happening, coupled with ligand, ligand to metal charge transfer reactions, oxidations and reductions. The kinds of species that are formed, I said they were organometallic species. In the case of mercury and methylmercury, we find uh, only mercury zero. In the case of selenium four, as we move from formic to acetic to propionic acid, we see the hydrogen radical, the methyl radical, or the ethyl radical forming the molecular species, similarly with arsenic and with iodine. With nickel, iron, and cobalt, only the carbonyl species form. The application range for photochemical generation is potentially broad. It includes all those elements for which chemical hydride generation has been successfully demonstrated, cold vapor for mercury, but even some of the transition metals, nickel, cobalt, copper, iron, and some of the noble metals, and even nonmetals. Uh, examples appear in the literature. I'm not going to spend any time on this. It's already been applied in the case of mercury running it through a liquid chromatograph with a formic acid mobile phase and then to a photochemical reactor. And here's the response from cold vapor mercury. We've done some experiments with these uh, deep UV LEDs and we can quantitatively convert inorganic mercury and methyl mercury to mercury zero. It has potential field applications because of miniaturization of the device. In fact, uh, using, I, meant, I, I didn't stop to mention that in the case of selenium-6, there is no photochemical reaction. Selenium-4, yes. But if you use that universal photocatalyst, titanium dioxide in the system, you can convert selenium-6 to a volatile form. And these researchers have done that by forming a photochemical reactor wherein they have attached titanium dioxide immobilized it to the wall and demonstrated equal photochemical conversion efficiency for selenium-4 and selenium-6. As a practical example of the application, we did isotope dilution of uh, a, a determination of nickel, iron, and selenium in a biological tissue and looked at the results. So we used a grid lamp for the photochemical reactor, passed it through the gas liquid separator, and then directly to the ICP. The interesting thing here is that when we look at the limits of detection that are available for pneumatic nebulization versus photochemical vapor generation, we see very substantial enhancements. Two reasons for that. One, we are introducing the sample at five milliliters per minute here and only one milliliter per minute here. But other than that, there's a tremendous enhancement in the vapor generation efficiency. So in summary, photochemical vapor generation is amenable to all the elements that chemical vapor generation currently encompasses but it provides expanded elemental coverage to other metals and nonmetals. It is a green chemistry using only formic acid and acetic acid. 
Fewer transition metal interferences. These reagents are very inexpensive, of course, compared with tetrahydroborate, and they're infinitely stable. And direct speciation scenarios can be conceived, such as the separation of selenium-4 from selenium-6. I'd like to say that it's um, fairly confident that photochemical, chemical, photochemical vapor generation is a newly emerging research field in analytical chemistry, and it may provide us with some powerful alternative to conventional chemical vapor generation uh, and with improved simplicity and cost effectiveness. So I hope that I've given you some indication of the interplay between instrumentation, sample preparation, and sample introduction. And I was going to say that despite decreased funding opportunities for atomic spectroscopy, at least in North America, the capabilities and applications of atomic spectroscopy continue to evolve in instrument companies and in academic research areas. Milestones in measurements arise continuously in sample preparation, sample introduction, and instrumentation. And in the instrumental sector, we've seen higher and higher resolution, not only in the spatial mode, but also in the mass mode and even the wavelength mode. Enhanced limits of detection, improved precision, reduced interferences, faster processing, and I haven't had a chance to at all cover Micropla microplasmas for lab on a chip and field deployment. I could talk about specific milestones in measurements that are very noteworthy, but I'm not going to because I've really run out of time. I think the future will uh, encompass an expansion of applications in all of these areas, and you can see they're very broad. And the applications in these areas will spur further developments in limits of detection and sensitivity improvements, stability and precision improvements, developments in, in detectors and improving dynamic range and response, improvements in the simultaneity of these instruments, such as the Matog Herzog instrument, the focal plane camera, uh, more robust multidimensional couplings where specific software is being developed whereby you can take an HPLC or a GC instrument and couple it up to an ICPMS and use software to process the results. And of course, uh, a greater variety of sample introduction and sample preparation um, uh, techniques. All of this in terms of milestones uh, leads me to this statement here by Steve Chu, physics Nobel laureate, 1997. New science begins at the next decimal place. And this, the striving for improved limits of detection, increasing sensitivity, that's actually giving us the next decimal place. And when you have that next decimal place, subtle things in nature become evident, such as uh, it used to be believed that most elements had uh, fixed isotopic abundances. It's becoming clear now as we have increased isotope ratio precision methodologies that there are many elements whose isotopic abundance varies in nature for various reasons. So there will be a continuing quest for enhanced limits of detection sensitivities, accurate precision, and clearly less expensive more accurate and precise data, which will come at us at a faster and faster rate. So we will certainly need all the chemometricians out there to help process it. Muito obrigado. It seems like of considering your topic, when I think about the determination part, it seems like the present and the future is going to be mass spec. It's going to be mass spec. I agree with you, yes, certainly, certainly. And I guess uh, someone, probably Graham Cooks, could give a wonderful lecture here on the miniaturization of mass spectrometers such that they can be taken directly into the field. And certainly you're probably aware of all of the advances in atmospheric pressure mass spectrometry that comes about from uh, systems like the DART, direct analysis in real time where not only biomolecules, but even metal containing molecules can be probed in real time by simply having a low power plasma being uh, directed at the sample and uh, the stream of uh, ionized material being interrogated by an atmospheric pressure sampling mass spectrometer. And of course, every time we pass through airport security, we are all being subjected to exactly this. That is a mass spectrometric method uh, for the uh, vaporization of a, of a swab from your hand or whatever, but they're, they're specifically targeting only a very few uh, characteristic uh, masses of TNT or, or whatever you have. But yes, I agree. 
We're, we'll probably be moving. I think everybody who has an ICP OES in their laboratory would actually like to move at some point in time to an ICP MS because you can just accomplish so much more. So we have three yeses. Um, yes, typically uh, for the vapor generation, the, the example that I gave there for uh, nickel, iron, and selenium was a sample of a biological tissue that was digested directly with formic acid and in the form of like a slurry, and then it was diluted and then subjected directly to the, vape, the photochemical vapor generation. In other cases, we, we would take a sample that has been digested with conventional microwave acid digestion and then mix it with formic acid. Now, what I have failed to say, and I have to admit and come clean, is that photochemical vapor generation does suffer from interferences, but these are oxidants. And so if you have nitric acid in your system, you will have a suppression of vapor generation because the nitric acid, the nitrate anion, is a powerful photochemical suppressor of radicals. So it, 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 it ties up radicals, as does oxygen. So they, they're, a, they're a radical chain terminator and, uh, and they cause an interference. So we need to find ways of eliminating nitric acid, which you can do by you know, boiling down and then converting over to another acid, uh, formic acid, or, or finding ways of, of dealing or masking with things like nitric acid. But yes, it's not completely interference free. I was trying to hide that. Is it catching up? Yes. Well, that's a very good question and very, very relevant because, of course, in the past, we had a very slow sample preparation techniques and we had ICP OES and everybody's waiting for the cooking to be done. And then we got the microwave ovens and now we have some pretty fast digestions. And clearly with the device that you've used, that autoclave, for example, where you can take 40 samples at a time and, and digest them, I, I would say that the sample preparation step is clearly caught up to the detection step and the analysis step. Probably what is going to be the longest step in the future is the, I'll call it analysis, meaning the analysis of the data. What does all that data mean that's coming out of the instrument? And uh, as the instrument manufacturers uh, spend more and more time on software, which is really the expensive part of the instrument, um, maybe they will build in more and more analytical routines that can crunch this data down, maybe have uh, chemometric approaches uh, available for looking at uh, relationships amongst the data. But yeah, this is a very serious, very serious issue. We always talk about you know, faster and more comprehensive, but at some point in time, the reality of having so much data will hit us. And that, that's already happening with the time of flight MS machine. You get every isotope of every element every time, and then you have to pick and choose, well, what are you going to do with it? So you've got massive amounts of data that you need to go through. <laughs>